<laughs> I wanted to ask you, actually, Eamon. Yeah. Um, having been an editor and a photographer, and it's something that photographers might think about as well, has your editing experience taught you how to edit your own work, or do you still take it to other people? Well, I, I, I tell you, when I, when I was first, first editing, I went there very bullish, because The Guardian was in a bit of a mess, and I was very keen that we... You know, you're never as good as the first couple of months you work somewhere. And I had to sort of change the whole philosophy and get them to use great pictures, which I thought were great pictures, which they didn't understand. And I, I, had, to, I had to edit on my nerve, because if you go into a room full of sub-editors and you say, this is the greatest picture we got in the room, it should be on the front, you've got to hold your nerve. You know, because in the old days, what used to happen, failed news editors used to become picture editors. Failed news editors. They weren't even good at news. And so at least I went in there, and for a little while, they thought, Christ, that's Amy McKay from The Observer. If he says it's a good picture, it's a good picture. And then you, I have to believe in my own gut feel what is good. And I think I do with my own edit. Um, would I benefit from having somebody else edit? Yeah, possibly. And I often wonder about the pictures I missed down the years. Because like Iris Murdoch, I think that's the best picture of that set. But there is a picture where you can clearly see that she's got Alzheimer's. She's sitting on her own, very vulnerable. And that from that set might be the best picture. But I love that one because of the empathy between the two. And I love doing doubles. I love doing pairs of people. But you're right. Um, do I need an editor? I'm probably too cocky to have an editor. Um, and it's, not, it's, not, it's just something I learned I had to do. Well, you know what it's like. You're going in against everyone in the... In a, in a newspaper, is a words person. And the designer, well, and designer now, sadly, I never had designers to deal with. I had sub-editors, wordsmiths. When I first went there, there were six stories on the front page of The Guardian. After about three weeks, there was three and one big picture. And I got called a space cadet, you know. But it sold papers. And so, yeah, I've got the confidence. Now, where that comes from, I don't know. But because I don't think I was particularly confident when I was young. But you, I like, horrible thing to say this, I'll risk it. I know more about this, these pictures than anyone else in this room. So if I can't be confident with these, I've got no chance. Now somebody may hate two or three of these, and that's good luck to them. But I put them in because I think they are, they're all worth putting in. Now my edit, you know, we could do an edit between us and maybe take ten out. It might be better to take ten out. Roger, did, was a Eamon ever your picture editor? No. Did, I was 88 to 90-something, yeah. Yeah, no, you, you, you're never mine either because I was on that other paper. You're on that you? awful paper, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Whoop, here we go, lovely. Bridget said yesterday she made it quite clear that she's not a photographer and obviously Bridget and Eamon have done the same job, one has a huge experience as a photographer, one didn't. Could you just comment on the sort of pros and cons of having that photography experience to, to be a picture editor? Um, yes, that's, that, is, that is interesting. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of editors who were photographers. Um, and it's interesting that you say that it's important skill to uh, pay for someone else. I mean, I will happily... Sorry, Bridget. Sorry. I will happily put my hand up and say um, I'm in this room probably the worst person to give a camera to. Um, I've got no idea what to do with it. Um, I don't compose within that block. I just see everything. I can't make um, order out of chaos, as, as Eamon was talking about. But I also think that... Um, Photographers that I've worked with, uh, quite a few from the Press Association with my own business partner um, and various people at, at The Guardian. Um, I think sometimes photographers, well, I, more than so, I think quite often they get too close and they can't actually see what it is that they've done. And um, I quoted Tom Stoddard yesterday, I'll quote him again now. He will say that the work that we know from him, uh, yes, he took it but he um, says his editor found it. And if you can have a relationship that works like that, an editor and a photographer, I think it's a great combo. Um, there are some um, photographers who will be able to edit their own stuff, but very often, I don't know if you've, 
ever seen a lot of contact sheets, but what I find fascinating about them is watching a photographer work the scene. I think, Eamon, you, you referenced that earlier. Um, there was a really good documentary, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, and Tom Pilston, uh, an independent guy, um, was in Bosnia, I think. And you watched him inside a refugee camp, and he was, you watched the contact sheets and you just saw how he worked to get to that picture but what he was interested in was probably because it very often is was the tiniest little element in the photograph and it takes the editor to find the bigger picture because there's a little there's it's it's like the grain making the pearl the photographer's interested in the grain and the editor gets the pearl it's how i would describe it Any more hands? Oh, there we go. I gave it as long as I could then. <laughs> I'd just like to say that the presentations have been fantastic and thank you for coming to North Wales. It's, it's great what Paul's achieved here. Um, so my final question really would be uh, aimed at you all. Um, there's been quite a prominence this weekend in documentary photography. Uh, sadly, it's not evident in galleries. Uh, do you ever see it coming back? Shall I give this to you, Roger? He's just learned how to do a selfie on a mobile phone and he's been a pain in the ass the last couple of days, I tell you. I mean, I think obviously um, it depends on the gallery because there are several galleries in the UK that do still show documentary photography. Side galleries, for instance, in Newcastle. Um, other galleries have got to, are very conscious about uh, uh, you know, getting funding to survive. So they tend to chase the money a little bit, chase the Arts Council funding. So it depends on their programme, depends upon their location in the country, depends upon their audience, if you like. Um, and I think maybe, you know, it depends on all those factors. And the question might be, is documentary photography best shown in galleries? Do you know what I mean? Is it better to show stuff in venues like this? You know, around empty shops, you know, discover stuff that... Because the problem with a lot of photographic galleries, I find, is they're kind of quite remote. And you walk in, you feel like you're just wearing a vest. You know, people look at you, you know. It's kind of like unsettling. And I think a, a gallery that can maybe try their best to make people welcome and discuss issues and, you know, things like that are probably better. And maybe, you know, as we discussed before, perhaps, you know, online presence for documentary is very important. The book form is very important. So whether the, the photographic gallery is the best place to show, show documentary photography is another issue, really, isn't it? I agree that being online has a much greater presence and much wider circulation in terms of viewers and uh, potential participation. Um, there seems to be a huge emphasis on, with photographers uh, on, on the photographic book, and yet rarely do photographic books reach circulations of more than, say, a thousand copies. So um, it, it's almost this sort of manifestation of photography being this precious commodity that galleries have reinforced over the last 20 years or so, really. Um, at least the sort of democratization of photography on the web is, is, is open to most people. Uh, but uh, I do find it interesting. As a student, I was brought up with documentary photography. It's a huge influence. And I believe that the camera had the potential to change the world for the better and make, make, um, give, give the common person a voice that um, perhaps they wouldn't have an opportunity to articulate verbally. But uh, I, do, I do feel quite sad at the fact that it's relegated to the fringes of photography today. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Jonathan mentioned that this morning when he was questioning Amanda about your respective projects as well. <laughs> about the, the Brighton ones? The, or, no, the, the ones we are showing here? Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, our Brighton projects because they were, I guess, documentary. Were they documentary? 
um, but they were shown in public places. So there was, you know, we knew that that was going to happen. So I think that almost yeah, affects how you're actually going to take the images. You know, it's not just for other photographers. You know, it's it's to mm. show the public, and um, it, for, for us, it was to show Brighton what was happening in their city. Um, and that was really nice because the like, whole families would go. It wouldn't just be for photographers. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Can I just say? I, th I think we we when we in the press really are, are, are to blame for the um, demise of documentary photography because if you remember, well, I don't remember picture posts, but I've got a lot of them. And I, I think, sadly, I mean, I often used to do workshops and things, and people say, look, you never run a story from whatever the trouble war zone was then. And to try and get it in, a magazine, that they all, when I was leaving, it was like one in four weeks you could get something quite heavy in the, in the Observer magazine or the Guardian magazine. Bridget will correct me here, but I don't think we get anything in there at all now. You know, who's it uh, called it? Uh, I think Don McCullum called it the pots and pans. You know, you get pots and pans and fashion. And, um, you know, uh, poor old Don was wandering around in his kind of safari suit with nowhere to go. Whereas 10 years previous, he was going to Vietnam and coming back with his films. Even if it was six weeks late and he was getting 10 pages and a cover. And, of course, I think what's also killed it is the fact that while we're in here, something may have happened and it'll be on a telly screen. Why will anyone buy it tomorrow? You know? You know, someone comes in on, on into London on Wednesday and said, I was just in, let's say it happened in Egypt. I was just in Egypt, well, you, do you want these pictures? And everyone's going to say, yeah, but we ran that story Monday. Whereas Don had it to himself. You know, Don went off to Vietnam, jumped on opposition helicopters. No one knew where he was. And he came back with a great set of pictures. And of course, they ran it. It didn't matter if it was six weeks old. Now, it matters if it's a day old. I was trying to show you those press photographers in the movie... Movie Tone News, or yeah, Movie Tone News. You know, the movies would take a week to get here. Now, it's probably on a telly out in the lobby. What's going on? Mm. You know, so I don't know how we compete. So we have to, we're to blame because we don't run enough, or we didn't run enough of it. Now we are, we're not newspapers anymore because we can't do news because news is dead. We can do sport just about, but everyone watches Sky. I'm sounding very depressive here, but it, it, we need to reinvent everything. The saddest thing, you remember Colin Jacobson did Re Reportage magazine? Great magazine, we all loved it, but why did it go out of business? We all loved it and we didn't buy it in big enough numbers. And his dream was to do Reportage, was it a monthly? Yeah. Monthly. Thank you. Um, in answer to your question about galleries, um, I find it quite sad that... Um, a lot of galleries don't see traditional documentary photography as an art form now. Um, it's going to have to change and it will turn around eventually. Um, but the, the, the good thing is, the plus side of the thing is, is that we've got places like Oriel Colwyn which are coming around and they actually will exhibit work like myself and I'm classed as a traditional documentary photographer. Um, whatever that means, okay. But yeah, it's it's quite sad, and I feel quite strong about that. But uh, there we are. <laughs> Maybe they're going to become like the poets, you know. They're going to keep going. Not many people will see it, but they're going to keep going. You know, I say the hardest thing I people I've met or sort of most impressive people are poets because nobody buys their stuff and they keep doing it. And I think the photographers along this line will keep doing it. I'm easy because I'm doing famous people. You know, it's going to end up on a book cover, a magazine or whatever, or mainly famous people. But the, the people who are doing documentary, it's almost like a poet saying, I'm going to carry on. And I'll keep doing this and I'll keep doing it and I'll keep trying to show it and keep, <coughs> keep trying to sell it. You know, I think maybe it's just the name has changed. Maybe they're not as sexy as they were 10 years ago because they were the stars. Documentary photographers were the stars when I was growing up. Don McCullum and... Um, all the great French photographers. Um, so they'll keep going. It's just you'll have to go to smaller venues to see it. I, I think it's really interesting how cultural these are as well. You know, when, when you do the documentary photography, generally, sorry, generally speaking, the audiences tend to spend longer looking at the images of a good documentary portfolio than a lot of conceptual art, where most time will be spent looking at the statement. 
and less time spent at the image itself. Um, just put my hard hat on at this point. <laughs> so I find that really interesting, you know, how images engage people. Is it the concept? Is it the photographic image? And I'm going back to the point you made about the newspaper yesterday, how you saw um, your advice to young people coming into photography was that don't overlook film rather than just concentrate on the still image. I found that quite frightening to think that the decisive moment uh, might not be important in the future in terms of a single image that tells a story. Uh, I found that really interesting and scary. <laughs> Um, we once lived in a world of black and white only, and now we live in a world of colour still. I think it's progressive. I'm, I'm a firm believer in progressing forward. Um, there is, uh, in exhibition number three downstairs, there is a video, um, and they've combined stills with it and sound. And it's a lovely um, small film about a, a man with his children. I don't know whether he is divorced or whether he only gets the kids at the weekend. I don't know if he's making a political point. I don't, you know, don't know any of that. But what I do know is that he loves those kids. And he's used... For, I don't know if you've seen this film. Have you seen... Oh, well, I don't know if there's still time. But if go and have a look because it's that... It's just a... He's used um, film uh, stills of his children as um, young kids. And they're now about 10 or 12. Um, so there's ones when they're two or three, a mixture of black and white, some colour, um, and he's videoed them and he's got the children talking. And he's just, he's not even making really uh, a timeline. Um, it's just the voices of the kids talking to the dad, oh, you've come to pick me up, or, you know, are we, what are we going to have? We're having McDonald's tonight. But it gives that sense of the relationship between the dad and the kids. And it's, and it's lovely. And I think that's what I'm talking about. I think that we now have video and it's more democratically available because it's on our phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roger made one last night. He found out about video as well. <coughs> oh, yeah, uh, I forgot to mention the video. Um, so and I think, it, I, th I think the future's a great place to go. I'm not saying forget the past, but I think the future's exciting. And I would, I would urge people to embrace it. Uh, going along with that, then, the picture's worth a thousand words. In the future, are the thousand words going to be important from the photographer to complement the image, perhaps? Somebody else may want to talk about that. I think visual language is essential. I think it's like music. I think there's a, mu there's a language of music, and there's the language of words, and there's, the lang there's visual language. And I think, I think visual language, whether we call it a thousand words, I think it's in our soul. I mean cave paintings, you know, before people were writing. We, we, we speak visually. It's one of the first things we do. Um, so I think, yes, I think it will always be there. Long bits of text. I have re I have real trouble with student work which has long, long text to try and explain it. You know, I just think well, the picture should be doing that. I do want to know who it was, where they were, you know, where it was taken, and all that sort of stuff. But when you read a whole philosophy on an A4, can you stand and read a whole A4 sheet by each picture? I, I can't. Now, is that just me because I'm not great with words, or is it just I don't know the pace of something? And also in galleries, I find how long are you meant to spend with each picture? You know, I don't really know that. And I go to lots of galleries and I go to lots of shows. Um, but in terms of, you know, do we know how to even look at pictures on the wall? Whereas magazines, you kind of, it seems to be the natural place. A magazine, a set of pictures, I know, even from Bertardi's day of 10 pictures of the Blitz or whatever, seems to be its natural speed and pace and whatever. Whereas I find the gallery wall, I find it quite difficult, the gallery wall. I know it's helping lots of people. But um, what are, how, are we meant to, how are we meant to look? I don't, I don't think a narrative helps it. A long narrative doesn't help it. Not for me. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, think, I think it's quite interesting what you've said about um, the gallery wall or maybe your, your preference for uh, magazines uh, and looking at photography in that way. 
And, and, and I hate to say it, Eamon, but you're prob you know, we're all about the same. Well, no, we've got two younger people here, but the rest of us are probably a similar age. And it's, it's how you view images is obviously very different now. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the advancement and democratisation, obviously, you know, Roger's phone, it's, it's democratisation, isn't it? Th those images can be taken all the time. And it's about everybody l always looking at things and assessing things in however we see them and always taking the opportunity and advantage of every single medium, really, or every single type of photography that we all do. Not to sort of say, this is the one we should, we should you know, embrace everything. Or, you know, if we didn't embrace everything, we'd still be using wet plate collodion. But I'm thinking of going back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow right down and just take two pictures a day on a tripod with a bit of film. And, you know, I think slow photography but there is best pictures. <laughs> I've got a fan. <laughs> At last. <laughs> That really, that really frustrates me. You know, they're, they're, they're taking all these pictures, but whether, what happens to them? And I, I know, I, I know, I'm a luddite, and I appreciate that. And I, you know, I, I, I took some pictures. There's a picture house down the road here, which has got the word pictures on it, and I took it on my phone because I had nothing else with me. And I, I shall cherish that picture because it says the word pictures when I was up in Colwyn Bay. But in terms of, it's not a great photograph, and I wouldn't show it to anybody. But I've got it. But I, I just think, if I had my tripod and I had my six by nine and I just took two single frames and maybe bracketed them a bit, I would be so thrilled with that picture. And I'm, I'm going back to uh, um, you know, slowing right down. I think if you have slow equipment, you take better pictures, is what I'm trying to say. Like you guys, I mean, surely when you go into architecture, you don't take that many pictures. You may wait until it's right and then you take it. And I think that's a discipline we could all learn from. And I think the phone and the digital camera has speeded us all up. I mean, I, I know a photographer in, Ma in Manchester used to photograph the Joy Division and whatever on one roll of film, 36 frames. He would do five rolls of five pictures of Joy Division, and if one of them was smiling, he'd wasted a frame because Joy, Joy Division shouldn't smile. Then he'd take a portrait of an, an author, then he'd have a house for sale. He'd do it all on one roll of film. Now he's got a digital camera, he can't go beyond 36. It's a wonderful discipline because I find if I take 100 pictures, why, why is, where am I going to start to edit? Just saying about the background of working with film is that we were limited to a, a prescriptive number of shots and, uh, and so the nature of photography governed the fact that we had to be disciplined in the way that we saw the world around us mm. and recorded that. Uh, young people coming through who haven't used film, who are working with digital, don't have those mm. kind of restraints. Um, does that make for a different form of photography and a less critical way of seeing? Mm. You could debate that, but um, it's, I, I still find today using, uh, when I use digital, I still have that ingrained sort of discipline of using my eyes far more than my finger taking pictures. You know, I'm still got that critical way of looking. It was like composing. one of Bridget's people at PA was only taking um, 20, 24 frames because it would have been a waste because they probably only took 10 pictures on that. That was a real discipline. You know, imagine you could have gone to 36, but you think, oh, well, 24 will do it because it's just a headshot or whatever. Sorry? That, well, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we're all coming from the same point on this, that if, picture, if photographs are to be seen by, by others, is part of the battle that we've got to educate an audience to take that time to look at the picture? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. It's, it could be a no, you're right. Um, but isn't that life in general? Everything is so quick, isn't it? Everything is so... Um, no one's looking at anything properly. Everything is immediate. You know, you see... I see people come out of school and they go straight onto their phones because they're missing something. You see people coming out of work and they, they ring people as soon as they come out of work and you think, well, 
what's all this urgency about doing everything? And it, 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 photography is obviously in there as well, but it's also life. You know, how many times in London do you, people bump into you because they're on their phone? You know, and, and it's just a way of life. It's all too quick and whatever. Um, but I'm speaking from somebody who lives in Saxmundham in Suffolk, which is very slow. Um, and I'm glad I do because it finds a life out of me going on the tube now, you know, whereas I grew up in Finsbury Park, which is a tough old place to grow up. But uh, I just think everything is too quick and I think maybe not these guys along here, but the sort of the average user of photography, it's all too quick. Um, and you say, how do, how, but how do you train? But you can't, the, what's that phrase? The genie's out of the bottle. We can't bring it back. It's out there. People are doing it. And, you know, is it Polaroid just brought their new camera out? You know, will people use Polaroid the way we did? It'll be a different use of it, you know. Um, I think pro John Burger needs to come out of his grave and, and show us and do another book of ways of looking. You know, I think that's what we all need. I think um, maybe five or quick comments. I mean, I don't think, obviously, taking on board what you've said there, I don't think the medium is to blame. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting film or digital. Photography on its own has no status whatsoever. It's a tool to be used. And the idea that you shoot more with digital, I don't think is strictly true. You know, Tom Wood on the buses project shot 10,000 rolls of film. Gary Winogrand left God knows how many rolls of film when he died. So it is possible to shoot an awful lot of film, more expensive of course. So the restraints of, you know, of that side of things are perhaps less with digital. But I think, you know, this debate about analog versus digital is um, an important one. But again, it's the kind of the way that the person uses whatever medium they want. And I think as photographers, we really have to embrace the fact that photography is bound up with technology. Can't escape that. But, you know, to say that one medium perhaps is more superior than another, that's, that should, you know, it's an inaccurate statement because it's the way the photographer wants to use whatever medium they want, whether it's an iPhone, 10-8 colour negative, 5-4, whatever, whatever the photographer wants to use is legitimate as, as long as they feel comfortable in the way of working. I come across quite a, f a bit of sort of like snobbishness, especially from perhaps art galleries that somehow shooting on film is more legitimate, it's real photography, it's more arty, you know, and it's just, it's just a, a silly thing to say because one is not superior to the other. It's the way it's utilised by the person to get the results they actually want. And what they're trying to say. And what they're trying okay. to say.